Now, Transitional Justice here on a Monday. I'm Jay Fidel, and this is uh, Annie Linden. We'll talk about transitional justice uh, in, in Afghanistan, where you may recall that we haven't done anything much to stop it. And so there's a big question about what, what Annie Linden can or should do to investigate um, you know, the atrocities, uh, especially the gender atrocities that are going on in Af Afghanistan while we speak. Well, welcome to the show, Annie. Nice to have you here. Thank you so much for having me, Jay. So let's learn a little about you. You're Finnish uh, and you're in Amsterdam and you went to school in Britain. Uh, so all of that means you're a sort of pan-European person. You probably speak four languages, am I right? Uh, yes, <laughs> actually, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, so I am originally from Finland, where we also speak Swedish. Um, and yeah, I've studied English since third grade, and um, I've also I speak Spanish because I've lived in in Mexico and in Colombia, mm. and um, they uh -huh. yeah they've been great experiences, and I'm really grateful for the opportunities that I've... Well, I I'm uh, I admire you for that. I'm actually <laughs> envious. I'm envious of everyone in your generation who who goes beyond, you know, and certainly anybody in PEJ goes beyond. So tell us how you got connected with Project Expedite Justice right here from Kona in Hawaii. So um, I study my master's at the University of Amsterdam right now. And um, uh, someone who is alumni of the same program that I'm doing now, um, he works at PEJ. And he got in contact with our program and they um, asked for interns and I found, um, I saw that they were looking for a case management intern. So I was like, this looks like a good, good opportunity to, um, to dive into. And also in the African context, because that's something that I haven't been uh, researching much mm. yet because I've been more focused on Latin America or uh, Middle East. So it's been mm. a great experience. Yeah. So transitional justice, war crimes, war crime investigations, prosecutions, atrocities, war criminals, all that. It's a it's an interesting world. It's a I must say, just being an outsider and looking in, it's a very exciting, stimulating, um, mm. you know, altruistic way to spend your time. Why that? Why did you make that decision, Ani? Um, I, I believe I've always been interested in, um, in human rights and seeing how the world works and how the international system in itself works. Um, so in my, in my undergraduate degree, I did international relations in the UK. And then I, from there, I, I realized that I was very much into also the legal framework and how the laws work in the international arena so now that i'm doing international criminal law as my masters i um i've gained a pretty cool um how to say view on how mm. international justice works and then um then into transitional justice um i during my time in colombia i studied transitional justice and I had the opportunity to work with an indigenous community and their political participation, uh, supporting their process. And it just it sparked me that I this is something that I want to do and work with communities and um, bettering the world and and um, how to say it be part of the good. Well, you, you're part of something that I, I have observed in Project Expedite Justice. It's a global phenomenon, a, sort of a new generation. It's an mm. international generation. Um, do you think your generation will actually make a difference? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, um, I think it's especially with the, um, now that the age of social media and how we're more connected. Um, through the internet, I think this has a massive impact 
on not only on on my generation but everyone can be everyone is connected um so especially like with the rise of technology and how the developments in in that area will have a massive impact on um, developing the laws and and mechanisms for um for people to access justice as well and to gather evidence for uh, specific crimes and yeah. So if I if I went around Europe, you know, from east to west, exclude Russia for this discussion. <laughs> if I if I went around Europe, would I find people like you there? If I went around Latin America, particularly Colombia, would I find people like you there? I mean, is this something which you can find people who are simpatico um you know in the in in these places I, i'm excluding the us because i i really don't think the us is in the same place your generation the generation we're talking about is mostly europe latin america and i suppose africa i mean of, uh, yeah of course um i have i think we are everywhere <laughs> Okay. It's 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 not just that the only in Europe or only in these this and that country, uh, people work for these things. There, like I, everywhere where I've gone and now where I've lived, I've connected with people who work in human rights and in the field of law and share the passion um, that that I I have as well. Mm -hmm. So do you think you'll be committed to this for your whole life? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. I'm happy to hear that because yeah. you're doing you're doing our work for us, Ani. <laughs> you, are, you are representing all of us to make a better world. So what what is your master's thesis about? Uh, my master's thesis is on uh, image based sexual violence in armed conflict. Uh, so call Really known as revenge porn. Um, so basically, when sexual violence happens in um, wartime, when that is filmed and put online, how we can how we can criminalize this act? Because once you put something online, it stays there. And what does that mean? Does it help to put it online to publicize it? What do you mean? Does it help the effort to stop gender violence to put it online? Oh, oh, I don't, I don't believe that it, I mean, that is to, to feel, first of all, to film that, um, these crimes and then distribute it online. This is a uh, sort of, a it re-victimizes the victim survivor uh over, well, let, me, over let me change the question honey the prosecutions the trials mm. the convictions uh you know the punishments the deterrence the action that you are taking to stop um gender crimes uh does that help if you put it online if you publicize it i mean it is it works as evidence, of course, but as uh, for the victim's privacy, it's not um, not ideal. <laughs> but for the I understand that we're not we don't want to violate anybody's privacy, yeah. but we we want to make it known that this happens. Hmm? Yeah, of course. I believe I believe there is there are ways to to uh raise awareness on this however on the on filming these acts is i don't think is the right way to no of course <laughs> so, well, <laughs> you know i've asked a lot of people from pej and people who are involved in human rights uh, whether they think that uh through the efforts of pej and other ngos around the world um there is a uh, a reduction of violations of human rights going on uh, are, are atrocities decreasing or are they increasing as we speak? 
well, um, I believe there, <clears throat> excuse me, um, atrocities, I think they keep happening, like we might not know about it, but yeah, with the technology, yeah, I, we do, uh, we are more aware of them, um, but it is difficult to say whether or not they are decreasing or increasing because atro atrocities will always happen. Um, well, that's, I'd like to catch you on that. Atrocities are always happening. You know, and gender atrocities are always happening from time immemorial. It's almost built into the human condition that there will be, you know, gender atrocities, uh, rape and abuse, including marital abuse. Um, and so how can we, how can we reduce that? Um, it's probably, am I right to say that it's everywhere in the world? Am I right to say there's no place exempt and there's no body exempt? No society is exempt from this um, so that you can find really horrendous things taking place everywhere. Uh, how, in a larger sense, how can we stop that? Um, first of all, I, I believe we, we have to raise awareness and we need we need people to take this seriously because um, in history and with women's rights movements, um, our, our fear has not been taken seriously and our, our suffering has not been taken seriously. And I, I think we're seeing it. We're seeing a change um, in people's attitudes that, hey, this is actually real. Um, so I, I think we need, yeah, we need to raise awareness um, and educate people and bring these uh, atrocities into light. Mm. So, so if the atrocities like, oh, happen in the context of a war, mm. um, that makes them somehow you know, more noticeable, um, mm. um, more important to, uh, to, to, to advise the world about it. I mean, and I, I, I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but, uh, you know, in Ukraine, Mr. Putin's army seems to be doing, um, you know, a lot of rape, um, mm -hmm. just as the Russian army did when it crossed Poland uh, back in 1945, 44, 45. There was a mm -hmm. lot of, a lot of uh, what do you want to call it, gender crimes. That sounds mm -hmm. like such a... a, 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 a an understated word, gender crimes. Um, but, uh, and, and there's been a lot of literature about that. Um, and I, you know, I, uh, I, I don't, you know, are, how much notice should we take of what Putin and Putin's army is doing in terms of these uh, crimes of, uh, of rape? I mean, it is horrendous, absolutely horrendous. Um, it's it's just something I I believe um, people just have been shocked that it's happening in the context of Europe. Um, however, I do I do see a sense of um, people seem to put more importance on this because it happens in the context of Europe. However, where was all this talk? What's happening to like everywhere else in the world? It's like, of, of course, it's important that we talk about, of course, it's important that we talk about Ukraine. But, and I love the solidarity that people show in hosting, hosting refugees and, um, showing just the support uh, to Ukrainians. Um, yeah, let's, what if, uh, yeah let's, well, let's let's go to Afghanistan because that's what we should cover today. <laughs> um, I, I, are you working specifically on human rights violations on gender gender atrocities in Afghanistan? What what uh, drives PEJ to be concerned about Afghanistan right now? Um, so I, 
At PEJ, I've not worked specifically on Afghanistan, um, but I, I wrote my undergraduate thesis on um, the US intervention in Afghanistan post 9-11 and how this intervention was framed as a, with a humanitarian rhetoric to save the Afghan woman from uh, the Taliban. So um, I'm, my personal interest has been in the Middle East and Latin America as well. But for my uh, thesis, I wanted to focus on specifically on this gendered narrative and how this ma masculine military action was justified to save the victimized Afghan woman um, when when it was, um, how to say, when Bush was not known as a feminist supporter, let's say that, like that. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, this is what sparked my interest. Why, why did, was this intervention framed like this when the president wasn't even in, in, uh, elected for his feminist stance whatsoever? So yeah. this counterterrorism, um, women's rights uh, rhetoric was uh, an an interesting point. So I wanted to investigate it more. Well, let me ask you: <clears throat> when the U.S. you know mm, took over in Afghanistan, one one would assume that the American presence would not permit um, that kind of abuse that Taliban was engaging in before. And uh, they, mm. they, you know, they, they took the power away from the Taliban, and um, and they said, "You will, you will now behave yourself vis-a-vis -vis women. Women can go to school, have reasonable lives. Uh, they, you know, they, they, they're elevated, and we are going to work hard. And I, I don't know whether we had the kind of success we hoped for, Bush or no Bush, um, but we did achieve some success there, and women mm. were elevated uh, during the mm, what is it?" 20 years that we, we were there. And we may have failed in other ways, and we certainly failed in, in keeping the Taliban out of power. Um, but we did improve the lot for women. Um, why, why then, um, why then do the Taliban bring it right back again? Is it part of the culture? Is it part of the religion? Then when they come back, and this is so interesting to me, when they come back, they come back as a military operation. They come back with guns. They take over in short shrift, and there's all kinds of um, you know history we can talk about there. Um, but but you mentioned a moment ago that when when you have this kind of um, what's the word this 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 macho um, warlike um, you know weapon laden violent or at least threat of violence takeover in Afghanistan, it brings um, the, the gender abuse right back, like a, like a rubber band, bang, and it's mm. all right back. And, and they promise us, they, you know, they make public statements to the world, they're not going to do that, but we are clearly seeing the Taliban is right back where it was. Why is that? Is that is that a matter of the the Afghan culture that this could happen? Um, I believe that in the 2020 uh, peace agreement between the U.S. and the Taliban, they they made quite a few mistakes with trusting the Taliban would do everything that they promised, and by by giving them um, everything that they basically wanted uh, undermined the Afghan government itself. So I, I believe the, the, the peace process itself was overall during, during the, the two decades, um, it was I believe the U.S. and like the the West wanted Afghanistan to be something that they imagine Afghanistan to be on paper, but it doesn't exist. So for 
um, the Western world going to another country which is already multi-ethnic, uh, very polarized society and telling them, okay, this is what we think peace is. This is what we think human rights is. This is how women um, should be in a society. It, it, it just doesn't work like that. It's, um, I believe it's, um, it's quite naive to, it's either like, yeah, naive to think that you can go into another country uh do an intervention like that and then say that this is how you're going to be it's just of course the the state the country has their own culture and their own uh differences and with the with the rhetoric on uh including women in in politics like in paper it's incredible but how you go about it and not fam familiarizing yourself enough about the local context and the tribal differences, especially in Afghanistan, the tribal differences in the country are massive. And the loyalty between women is not gender based it's more class based, it's more tribal based, uh, ethnic based. So when like, of course, there were uh, women were included in uh, the in in politics, and there they got education and healthcare. Um, but the, I think it stems, uh, or it boils down to the tribal differences in the country because there was already before um, this, um, this common this mistrust in, in the government. And as the country is polarized, there are class differences. So when, when you include some women in politics and some women in this and that, it's, it's often the political elite, but mm. then, then um, other communities might feel that they are still mar marginalized and it's rather tokenistic in a sense. Mm. So could, could the United States have done a, a better job in the 20 years uh, to, um, to raise women up to uh, you know, incorporate them into the society properly. Um, and could the United States have done a better job? I think you're saying that it could have done a better job in the peace agreement uh, to try to leave, leave Afghanistan in, in better condition vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, uh, you know, the status of women. Uh, what, what could we have done both during that 20-year period and the peace agreement uh, to avoid the result we are having now? That's a great question. Um, I would say, I would say that um, the US should have included more of the ordinary Afghan voice in the, in the peace talks and in, in, in the inclusion of uh, political participation in general. Uh, because there was this mistrust already before before 9/11 uh, happened, before the invasion happened, there was Afghanistan was already polarized. Um, so I think including more ordinary people rather than um, the political elite and going and actually getting to know what the society was like and not how it ought to be. So now we're not there anymore, <clears throat> and we have very little to do with the place. I, I'm not. I don't think we have diplomatic uh, connections with them. We mm. we go through uh, agency arrangements. We we don't mm. have anybody on the ground at all. Um, mm. And um, and but we hear through mm. Project Expedite Justice and other NGOs, uh, human rights organizations, that there are violations 
of women's rights uh, and women's human rights in, in Afghanistan. Mm. So it strikes me that this is a very hard thing for us to do. A, to find out what's going on. B, to identify, you know, the, the people and the processes involved and, and um, you know, actually investigate, and, mm -hmm. you, know, uh, uh, you know, violations of those rights and prosecute those rights. We, are, we have shut ourselves out of it. Uh, <clears throat> and so I ask you, you know, what can Project Expedite Justice do? Uh, what can the United States do? What can Western Europe do? What can anybody do in, in, order, to, <laughs> in order to improve the lot of women uh, in Afghanistan today, where, where the violation of women's rights in Afghanistan are an essential part of its government? It's, it's, it's a core point of the way it is governed by the Taliban. I mean, it's, it's, this is what they do. What can we do to stop that? That is a good question. It's, um, it is always, uh, I don't know. I think I, I often go back to like what we could have done and what we should have done, but in the end, does it, does it help? No, um, no, we have yeah. to fashion a strategy now. Yeah. We have to do what we can do. I mean, it's, Afghanistan is not the only place. There are other countries <laughs> that have similar <clears throat> problems. And yeah, of course, uh, yeah. the question is, uh, how can you investigate war crimes that are behind a, a curtain that way? How can you prosecute people who you can't, you know, you can't arrest? You can't mm -hmm. bring them to justice. You can't get them in front of the International Criminal Court of Justice. Um, <clears throat> you can't, you, they never leave the country. Uh, you're not going to get the local... Uh, judiciary to do anything. The local government uh, doesn't mm -hmm. care. As a matter of fact, it's perfectly fine with what's going on. It's a way uh, that the local government enhances its own power, I would say, as an outsider. Um, so what, what can you do, Ani? Give me a, a course of action. Hi. Um, yeah, um, I, I believe uh, we, have, we have to keep uh, pressuring uh, governments and um, international organizations um, and instead of uh, for example the UN just condemning what's happening but actually doing something so I believe uh, it's NGOs like PEJ um, and other organizations that do the work and the power of so we should should not uh, underestimate the power of social media and how we can put spread awareness and um, do activism uh, from our home directly. Well, can uh, people, can women in Afghanistan and Kabul, for example, can they report these crimes out on the internet? Is there a way to electronically communicate uh, what they would like to tell us? And then we could, of course, uh, raise uh, global awareness about that if we knew, if we had mm -hmm. that information. Is there a way that information can get out of Afghanistan, is getting out of Afghanistan? Uh, there are women's organizations in, in Afghanistan. So, yes. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to ask you about is, um, you know, um, other countries and, uh, of course, uh, Project Expedite Justice and uh, other NGOs do have a certain amount of leverage, mm. uh, not only by information, but by sanctions, uh, mm. by saying, you know, uh, we could give you money, we could give you support of one kind or another, or not. And um, this happened right after the United States left. I, I, I don't know what happened, you know, more recently, but um, if, if you want us to show you favor, to support you, to help you in one way or another or many ways, we could and we will, but you've got to stop doing this to women. Um, mm. it, 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 was that successful? Could it be successful now? Uh, I'm sorry, could, could you repeat the question? If I, if I said, for example, we have, we have some of your frozen assets, like Russia, like the sanctions, mm. and we will turn that over to you. We could give you aid. We could give you mm. billions of dollars of aid. We know 
We know your economy is on its back. We know your children are starving. We could help you, but we need commitment from you. We need you to stop the atrocities. Then we will help you. Has that been successful? Could it be successful? Uh, has, any, has any country or organization done that to do that kind of transaction, that kind of deal? I mean, yeah, with like Taliban is now that they are in power, they do struggle with the uh, uh, financial aspect, the eco economical aspect. Um, it, I, I don't. I'm not really sure um, how that would happen um, because in order to I don't know. In order to do that, they you would have to recognize them as well, and um, and getting into that sort of like a diplomatic establishing dip, that sort of diplomatic um, relations would bring them legit, legitimacy as well. Mm. But I I also think with these. Um, uh, talks that Taliban would um, have with um, with other states is Taliban already also struggles with internal power struggle and the leadership, and I don't know how um, how they would like who would make the decision who who would negotiate because there's already some um, turbulent times within uh, them because some some branches of Taliban feel that they don't have enough power and then uh, some others make the decisions. So then how would they even get to these um, negotiations? But yeah, they, yeah, the aid is an, it's, it's an interesting question because they're, the people are suffering and they, they're they're in an economical crisis. Well, you know, it could be they don't care. They don't care about the people suffering. They just, you know, we, we see that in other countries, and there are some people in the United States feel that way. It doesn't matter how the people are doing. The important thing is to stay in power. It's the, um, you know, it's the mark of uh, autocracy. Uh, mm. We don't, we, you know, and I, and I suspect there must be some of that, especially when you say that their government is not functioning very well. But here's here's one last question, and I realize that this is um, you know political or geopolitical question uh, mm -hmm. as much as it is a, a human rights question. But it, you know the Taliban is is corrosive. It's toxic. The mm -hmm. Taliban uh, you know has never been good at building a society. Mm -hmm. uh, they they may uh, you know provide some uh, some benefit to some people, but only for an obviously manipulative reason. Um, in a larger sense, they, they can't run a government. They can't run a country. They never have been able to do it, and they're not able to do it now, even though um, they ostensibly have the power to do it. And they don't have the skill, and uh, they don't have the knowledge, and their, their people are not oriented to do that. Yeah. So the question I put to you is, is the Taliban, uh, with its war against women, that's what we have here, a war against women is the Taliban sustainable? Is it is it going to be able to stay in power, or is it going to collapse uh, ultimately as a way to govern Afghanistan? As it seems to me that that possibility logically exists, and it's one we ought to be watching. What do you think? I don't think they're sustainable, um, precisely because they have this power internal power struggle just they they don't have this established hierarchy and they you you can't function as a state or an organization when there's too many people hungry for power and wanting to be the one to make decisions so they don't have this internal cohesion so i don't think they can survive, but yeah, I guess you never know. <laughs> well, I think, you know, it's interesting that, uh, you know, PJ 
um, is concerned about Afghanistan, and we all are. Um, but what I think what is interesting and what is interesting in your work is that in a in a strange way, Afghanistan is an exemplar. It's a closed state. It's a state at war with its own people. It's mm -hmm. a state with a with a culture that divides. Um, it's a state that is probably in the long term not sustainable, even in the intermediate term. Um, and it's not the only one. And I think it's a learning experience. Don't you know? It's a learning experience for us, the ones who are looking at it and studying it and trying to figure out how to help the, those who are inside it. You know, the ordinary people, men and women who mm -hmm. want to lead a reasonable life in, in today's world, um, that we need to learn from the Afghanistan experience so that we can apply those lessons to other countries that are similarly closed countries, closed states, where there are violations of human rights going on inside. Uh, don't you agree? Isn't this part of the examination that mm -hmm. uh, Project Expedite Justice and other uh, human rights uh, NGOs should be making to mm -hmm. carry those lessons elsewhere? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's um, History tends to repeat itself, <laughs> as we've seen now with Afghanistan as well. Um, but yes, I I hundred percent agree. Well, thank you, Annie. Annie Linden, a, a Finnish lady, <laughs> edu educated in England, and living in Amsterdam, even as we speak, uh, and concerned with human rights all over the world, including in Latin America, Africa, Europe, and certainly in the Middle East. Uh, thank you so much, Annie. We really appreciate this discussion with you. Thank you so much for having me. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.